I'd like to call to order the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting, a regular agenda, for September 9th, 2013. Welcome, everybody. This is our first uh, official meeting with our new setup, and uh, it's certainly very different, and um, my hope is that those of you who are in the audience can appreciate that we used to be sitting up here, like four and a half, five feet above everybody. This is really a, a major change and um, one that I think will be uh, continue, continue to be well received. If we could have a roll call, please. Chairman Walsh. Here. Council Guvenali. Here. Council Jordan. Councilor Ray. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Wagner. Okay, if we'd all stand, please. For our Pledge of Allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Our uh, first order of business is uh, council reports and correspondence. Is there any council reports or correspondence? Did anyone like you? David, please. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending the 10th annual Wifflepalooza event in the Brentwood neighborhood. Uh, this uh, event was featured on the front page of The Courier. It is uh, uh, due to the uh, inspiration and hard work of the Lavalley family, and it's just a lot of fun. And over the last 10 years, it's raised approximately $4,500 for the Thomas Memorial Children's Library. So a big uh, thanks to the folks in Brentwood primarily who are behind that event. It was a lot of fun and does good for our library. Great, thank you, David. Are there any other reports? Jessica? Um, yes, the Library Planning Committee is proceeding um, in its charge uh, from the Town Council. There will be a survey online, and maybe, Frank, you might uh, kind of continue with that information. Okay. okay. Um, so in our continuing effort to, uh, to solicit uh, feedback and insights and, and points of view from the community when we are uh, going to be circulating a survey which will be online using um, a survey monkey so it's not going to be this uh, statistically a, a uh, scientific survey approach but we thought it would be a way in which to get some additional information from the community to supplement the uh, the uh, round table that we held last week at the high school the survey will be posted online on Friday Thursday the 12th. Thurs Thursday the 12th, mm -hmm. and we are going to be sending emails out to people to encourage them to uh, respond to it, as well as having paper surveys around town. So we really are trying to get as much public input to the process as possible so that the, everyone's points of view is reflected in the ultimate recommendations that we make to the council. Great. Thank you. Any other reports? Uh, we did receive uh, at each of your places tonight, we did receive a, um, a letter um, to us about the decision of uh, the change in the senior citizen membership rate at the community services, especially as it relates to the Don Richards pool. And uh, talking to Michael, it's my understanding that the um, community services uh, advisory group has responded to these citizens relative to this but I don't know Michael did you want to add anything to that yeah I, I know an email uh, thanks Jim I know an email went out today from the community services director uh, to some of those citizens I'm not sure it, it, they also sent an email so I'm not sure it went to all of them okay and who was CC but I know it went to the, yep. the, the lead signer uh, basically saying that community services about a, nine months ago perhaps went to a policy of no senior citizen discounts and that what citizens are seeing today is is it really catching up with the pool uh, that originally it it, uh, it it applied to the pool at the beginning but because of the 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 way that the timing of the different memberships uh, it's a little bit different I just did find the email here the decision was made last fall with the support of the community services advisory commission and the goal was to provide programming facilities at the most reasonable price possible to all participants. When we have to figure in a potential senior discount that became the base cost for either a program or a facility, in essence, non-seniors pay an escalated price. So it's the old, you know, if, if you give someone a discount, someone else needs to pay for it. Uh, and then, uh, this is again from Russell Packer, the Community Services Director, 
he goes on to point out that they have a scholarship program in place that, helps, that can help residents who have financial need and allow them to participate in any of the various uh, community services programs and facilities. Yeah. I mean, this particular um, membership was $230 a year for the pool for an individual. It's now $300. That's the, that's the difference. But it's my understanding that they did reduce the overall uh, membership by $5 by being able to sort of equalize this across all membership uh, categories. So I just want to I just want to make sure the record reflects the fact we've received this letter. So, um, just to clarify, yeah. so this is a revenue neutral event. That that is the indication from yeah. the community services director. Yeah. I'll Which, forward to you the email that we, we received from yeah. him. It'd be good to take a peek at it anyway, yeah. especially from a finance standpoint. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, and also the. Um, the uh, town center, is there any update from the town center committee, Jamie or David? Anything? We're, we're going to be meeting, uh, I believe it's October, before our next uh, council meeting in October at 4 o'clock okay. that day. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that is it for our, in terms of our next meeting. Okay. And then I understand we had some news about a key bank today. Yeah. Jamie, I, I don't know, Jamie might, Jamie might want to okay. share that with us because I know he. Yeah, well, I, I I happen to have a business checking account there for my law, uh, my law office. But um, so I received in the mail today a notice that KeyBank will be closing effective sometime the next month or two. I said wow. December sixth, yeah, yeah. December. Hmm. Uh, so there will no longer be any bank in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Wow. Um, oh, that's incredible. I think that behooves the town to um, maybe solicit some uh, interest from some other uh, banks to see whether or not. Mm. There could be a bank situated situated yeah. in the town. Because I know the town, I know the town hall is uh, walks uh, just a very few steps up the road to make mm -hmm. whatever transaction decisions they have to make. So it's going to be a little different, isn't it? It's a long walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Long walk to Mill Creek. <laughs> it's going to impact us. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, they've been certainly uh, great neighbors for a very long time. Um, Sorry to see that happen, but you know, um, in these times, you know, these decisions are uh, are tough. But they they obviously, you know, it's all about uh, survival in some ways. But uh, okay, any other uh, reports, correspondence? Nothing. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next item, which is a finance committee report. Frank, do you have anything to report? Um, well, we're continuing to work on the uh, long-term capital planning <coughs> process. Um, Michael Moore at the uh, school board and myself have been meeting and exchanging data. Mike met, met with Michael last week to get some information in terms of how one plans for um, uh, bonding um, when it's necessary. And um, we'll continue to meet, I guess we're meeting tomorrow morning actually, uh, you and uh, John Christie and Michael and myself to review some of the materials in order to get prepared for our September 20th meeting. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I think we're making progress in that respect. Great. Um, appreciate all that that work. That's that's great. Um, and I appreciate the school board's, uh, you know, emphasis on this as well. It's uh, it's it's good news. I mean, I know at the teachers uh, meeting, uh, the superintendent alluded to the teachers that this was a major emphasis that was being placed in looking at overall capital needs long term. And I know a lot of teachers were pleased to hear that there, at least there was a, a lot of thought and a lot of discussion going on around that from a long-term strategy standpoint. So, so tomorrow, John Christie, the chair of the school board, and myself will be meeting with the two finance chairs just to get an update and uh, sort of a strategy around the next round where we have both boards together. And as you both, as everyone knows, the both boards will be together, and there will also be a, the report from the auditors at the same time. And I know some of you can't be here, but we are going to go forward with that meeting. And uh, the auditor's report certainly will be available to you, David, if uh, you, know, you, you wish to read them ahead of time. OK, moving on to the next item, which is the first opportunity for citizens to address the council for items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to do so? Now, don't everybody rush to the podium. But seeing no one, we'll move on to the town manager's report. Michael. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. Just very quickly, uh, 
the library just finished this summer reading program, now the school's back in session, and over 500 different individuals participated in that this year, which is pretty amazing that everyone kept reading during the summer and utilized the library for that purpose, and uh, it went well. The library was also named at the end of last week as, as a family place library, which is a program that focuses <coughs> on, particularly on early literacy and preschoolers, and we're one of 250 in the country that's, that's part of this program. Uh, so, uh, Rachel uh, Davis, the librarian, is actually going to be going down to a library on Long Island, New York uh, in the next couple of months for training on that program to learn more about it. But it, it really looks at, you know, what you do in the library, particularly for preschoolers, and to make sure the programs are relevant, they prepare kids for school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it, you know, it sounds like a, an excellent program. Uh, the police department, I you know, mentioned last month, I believe we have a new Sergeant Paul Fenton. Since that time, uh, Mark Dorval, who was our community liaison officer, has switched positions and now is the detective, which was Paul Fenton's position. Uh, Mark's position of community liaison officer has been uh, assumed by David Galvin, one of the police officers, so he's already beginning to work with the schools and, and other parties uh, as the community liaison officer. And did want to mention we're having another <coughs> prescription drug drop off on October 26th. Those have been fairly popular. Uh, in public works, the Charles Road project is, is virtually done. There's a few more. The driveway the connections, a little bit of paving needs to be done. It's supposed to be done last week, didn't happen. Uh, Bob is trying to work with the, uh, the paving company to get them here. Uh, the Shore Road sidewalk uh, is, is now complete. Uh, looks. Uh, you know, it's nice to have a, it's already, you can see people using it, uh, particularly ones who are, who are running from one place to another, and they now have that section uh, that they can uh, safely use the sidewalks. That's good to see. They, they did a great job on that. Yeah. They did it fast with very little disruption. Yeah. Really, it's really mm -hmm. terrific. Good, and this new exterior fencing as well that's been put in by another contractor, and it's actually still a little bit more of that to be done. Uh, some, a little bit of it was back ordered. Uh, Spurwick Avenue, there's a culvert on Paputic Drive, uh, under, near Paputic Drive, which is due to be replaced. This is not the Paputic entrance to the golf course. Paputic Drive is over closer to the medical building. And there's a, there's a low point, there's a culvert, and before we do the paving there, uh, that culvert's being replaced on the 18th of September, so there's going to be some disruptions. Uh, the ladder truck was just, did had a major refurbishment after 20 years, $70,000 stripped down to uh, no paint, all the, all the red sections that get repainted and a lot of, you know, rust work to stop uh, rusting. Uh, the seats were replaced, there were, there were issues with those. Uh, the windshield was replaced, the bumpers were replaced. Uh, just, you know, it, it, what it really does, it, you know, it takes a vehicle that to replace would cost $600,000 and for $69,000 it was really given a new lease on life for, you know, another uh, 10 years or so, uh, 10 years or more. So uh, it was good to see it back and up and running. <clears throat> we also have uh, eight new personnel that have joined the fire department in the last two weeks. Uh, we have six uh, new students from Cables with High School who uh, run with the fire department on the different activities, and that's always helpful. Of those who graduated in recent <clears throat> years, we still have four of those who are in college who come back and help out. Uh, so it is something that, that continues thereafter. We also have four students from SMCC who are living in the dorms who are becoming affiliated with the Engine One company in terms of responding to calls down in that end of town. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, if you look at that, uh, that's a total of 10, actually. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at, you know, to get 10 new people uh, in very short time, you know, Peter Gleason, the fire chief, was mentioning this morning that there was an article or something on TV about a couple of other departments, actually the, the communities that border us, uh, having challenges with, with volunteer personnel for the fire service. And we're fortunate uh, because of the, our continuing volunteers, because of these programs with the high school, with Southern Maine Community College, uh, we, we do okay when we have fires in, in terms of getting folks to respond to them, so it's good. And finally, there'll be a town center forum on October 17th. Mm -hmm. uh, and did want to mention, to remind everyone, the next regular council meeting is on Monday, October 7th. Uh, which is a departure from normal. It's uh, with the holiday the following Monday. The decision was made last month to move that meeting to uh, the first Monday. Good. Thank you. Did you want to say anything about the um, 
appreciation or the we had a we had a great luncheon at the snow squall that happened between our last meeting and now do you want me to or do you want uh, to? well i thought it was first of all deb thank you for all the energy and effort that you put into putting that together and it was very well attended yeah uh, and I, um, I was, I was extremely impressed by the folks and the conversation at the table and the enthusiasm about working for Cape Elizabeth. And we were able to uh, single out uh, Mr. McGovern for all of his service, which I thought was. Uh, there were 17 people singled out. <laughs> <laughs> See, but you, but you singled out. But you, you happen to be the person here tonight that we can uh, single out. Okay. You got that one. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I mean, I just, that's one of the few benefits of having this uh, in my hand. Okay. Anyway. Well, th thank uh, you for that. Yeah. We, we did discuss today with uh, the personal advisory committee representatives from every department. They were very appreciative. It was, we had a luncheon at the Snow Squall. They very much enjoyed that. I uh, thought the Snow Squall did a good job. They appreciated seeing quite a few of the counselors who were able to be there, yeah. to be there, and uh, yeah. that's all good. So. You no, know, I thought it was uh, very well done, and I appreciate all the work that went into the, to that behind the scenes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any questions for the manager on his report, or any uh, any, any redirect on on that? No. Again, Michael, thank you for the detail. I think that for all yeah. of us, it's important to kind of get a sense of what's really going on around here. And do you have the, another. Well, add I, I didn't else? want to defer to Deborah on giving an update on the <clears throat> November election. Uh, absentee ballots for the November election will be available sometime the first week in October. Um, I think October 7th or so is that first week. We anticipate um, the ballots being available. Prior to that, information will be on the town's website, as it always is, including um, how to vote absentee, the ballots, both the state and local ballots, uh, and the absentee ballot applications. So that will be coming up sooner than later in the next few weeks. So. Will be posting as and we have a uh, we have a few candidates running in both. We do. There are three for council, three for school board, and two seats available on each. So, and those names are listed on the website as well. And there's nothing else on this ballot. Not for municipal. There are some state bond questions. Um, okay. Now. And those are the those are the highway. What's the, the highway and then the and the and the, uh, and the ones that are uh, to uh, the alcohol beverage. Is that? No, there's, uh, I don't recall that. You might be right, but there's some on higher education, mm -hmm. uh, some monies for the community colleges, for some buildings, okay. some work at the University of Maine. Great. It might be a little bit for corrections, I'm not sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is the review of draft minutes of August 12th, 2013, and the chair will entertain a motion. Kathy? I move to approve the uh, draft minutes of August 12th, 2013. Do we have a second? Second. Second, Frank. Do we have any discussion? Any comments? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of minutes as presented? It's unanimous. First item law on the agenda is a public hearing for the building permit issuance notification procedure, item 117. So I will uh, declare the public open. If there's anyone who wishes to address this question, please come forward and take the podium and uh, to give us your name and address. We appreciate that. Doesn't look like anyone is rushing to the podium. So I guess I will declare the public hearing closed. And move to item 117, the building permit issuance notification procedure. And I'll turn to our ordinance committee chair, Kathy Ray. Thank you very much. Um, you'll see on your agenda that um, the final draft, I guess, that has been worked on by ordinance planning and I think just about everybody else um, is there for uh, potential um, <clears throat> approval this evening. And uh, I printed out the agenda because it comes out with red but when I put it on my pad, it doesn't come out red. So I don't know if you all uh, can tell the differences, but um, for those who've been on the ordinance and have worked on it, you would know. Uh, and we also have um, Ben here, our code enforcement officer. So um, I guess one of the questions that I've been asked to ask is if Ben is ready to implement this and maybe we should direct questions to Ben. Ben, would you like to join us at the podium? Thank you, Ben. Yes, good evening. 
We estimate that one to two times per week we'll be sending a notice out for a building permit uh, based on the triggers identified in the ordinance, which is 125 feet from the normal high water mark, uh, an, ex an expansion of a structure or a new structure within 125 feet of the normal high water mark or within 10 feet, an expansion of a structure within 10 feet of a setback line. And, and those seem to be the sensitive issues we, we have. We, we, we have two in particular that are in court and, uh, and they're being heard based on timeliness because the neighbors didn't know that the building permits had been issued. And I, that was the primary driver for this ordinance was to prevent that from happening. And uh, I, I do like the way the ordinance tur turned out. And uh, from an administrative perspective, I think there'll be one to two notices sent out per week. It'll go to the immediate abutters, uh, probably four, five, six notices uh, for each building permit that, that triggers it. And uh, that's not a large administrative burden. We, we have the staffing to do that. I'll, that will generate a few additional questions and phone calls for me, and that can be absorbed as well, but we're, we're ready to implement it. Anybody have any questions for, for Ben? David? Uh, ben, one of the primary issues that came before the Ordinance Committee, and I'm assuming before the Planning Board as well, though I didn't watch those proceedings, was uh, which abutters would actually get the notice. And there was a lot of talk about whether it should be abutters within 50 feet of the property affected or, or some other number. And I'm just wondering if you had any insights in, into why the Planning Board went the way that it did. Well, I strongly encouraged the, the 50 feet. I, I was concerned about the administrative burden if it grew out to 200, 400 feet. We'd be sending 25 notices out. And when you send out notices, that generates calls and visits. So I did see it I, at the level it's at now. I don't think it'll be burdensome administratively. I, I do think if that if that number grew to 200 feet, I, I did I, I was nervous that the administrative burden would be a little too much for our office. And was it your view that 50 feet distance would capture the immediate abutters to the property that had the permit issued for? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, you obviously get each abutter on the side. If there's an abutter on the rear, and 50 feet, there. It's very rare that a right of way other than Route 77 is more than 50 feet wide, so you'll get the abutters across the street and immediately adjacent. And, and I think that's most important. Those are the people most affected. Um, not necessarily for Ben, maybe for Kathy. Um, the folks that were concerned about this, um, did they weigh in in your meetings and in the public input portion of whatever? Yes. Well, we had we had many uh, people weigh in, and, and they had um, concerns about the setback. And actually, Ben um, came to some of our meetings to assure them and actually worked with some of the folks that thought it should be 100, 200 feet. Yeah. And he gave them some examples that the 50 feet would, in fact, cover the you know immediate abutters. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, he could probably comment on how well that particular you know aspect went because that wasn't part of the meeting but um, yeah. he, he worked with those folks outside of the ordinance committee meeting but we did have a lot of participation in these meetings yeah um, we really okay. did so I, and I think that um, we did our best to reach out to the people who had concerns and give them an opportunity to speak and um, you know mm -hmm. and we adjusted some of our our thought process from from some of the comments that they made so I don't know if um, Jessica or David want to Anybody? Add anything? But ben, any feedback from you in terms of those conversations around 100? We, we, we did alter the ordinance a bit based on some of the comments, and, and, and a few folks did come into the office during the day to get on uh, our GIS so they could see what would happen. We picked a few different properties and did a 50-foot radius off of those properties so they could see exactly who, who would be noticed in different situations. Mm -hmm. and, and once they saw that, they did see that more people, more people would be noticed than they initially thought. 50 feet sounds pretty short, 
But when you go from every corner of the property, it, it ends up grabbing several neighbors. You, you end up with four to eight people usually. Is the notice usually. going to be just a U.S. post, or is it going to be certified? It's U.S. post. U.S. post. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add anything, Jess? Well, the other um, part of uh, settling on 50 feet, it was Ben's recommendation, and we had, a, again, a lot of the public that came to our meetings, and various citizens offered 100 feet, 250 feet, 500 feet was one. And, and for all matters of practicality, 50 feet from, from all the property line perimeters does bring in all the immediate abutters, and when you go beyond that, the issue becomes, well, where do you draw the line? You know, so 50 feet kept coming back as the most practical solution. It definitely will incorporate all immediate abutters. So. Yeah. Good. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, two things. Um, first, is this a, just comparison to surrounding communities, is, is this um, ordinance consistent with other communities like ours that are in the immediate area? We, we did have a building permit notification in York. It, it, was, it was only within 125 feet of the ocean, so this expands upon that slightly. But th that notice did grab more people. It went out uh, 200 feet, and, and that's how I sort of understood the administrative task of when you notify people, you know, when you notify 25 people, it really generates a workload. Versus, versus notifying about five people right. would be negligible. And I, I guess I would imagine that if five people are being notified in a neighborhood, that notice doesn't stick with those five people. It's right. to expand <laughs> on. So, Correct. so it's not enough yeah. that anyone's being robbed of any yeah. rights. Yeah. 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 Good. And we'll see how it goes. We'll, excuse me. Go and, and we'll see how it goes in the first year. And you know, if we're if we're missing people, they'll they'll let us know, and and we could propose a change to stretch yeah. it out. Yeah, um, how, if you were to look at the, the property that was disputed in Shore Acres and given the proposed um, changes to the ordinance, how many people would have been noticed in this situation? How many abutters? Uh, I, there, there's a couple yeah. there. I, Murphy Goldman, is that the one you're on? I mean, I guess I was thinking of the... Um, Livingston property. Uh, if I remember correctly, you you get three abutters across the street because of the way the 50 foot goes across the street, and then you get the two on either side, right, so and then in that case, five. the ocean's to the rear. So I, I think it was five. five. Okay. And following up on Frank's point, um, did you do a survey of other towns other than York? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, and finally, the, is there a definition in the, ordin in the definition section of the ordinance regarding what, minim what minimum setback means? Because when I read that, I'm a little bit confused. You know, um, I, I don't practice this type of law. It just says within 10 feet of the minimum setback. Yeah, the, the, minimum, the minimum setbacks are they're, they're in the dimensional tables as the the, the required setback in different zones for the Pilot Point neighborhood, it's 25 feet on the sides because those are non-conforming lots. So if someone was proposing an addition within 35 feet of, the, of that side property line, that would, that would trigger the notice. So could someone do um, an expansion of their structure uh, that's substantial? that doesn't fall within the 10 feet of the minimum set, setback and not trigger this notice requirement? Yes. Yeah, if, if, if you're not within 125 feet of, of a normal high water mark, so that, that could be inland or coastal, if you're not in that 125 foot zone and you're not within 10 feet of your setback, then you could do significant expansions without triggering the notice. Any other questions for Ben? The fact that there are a couple of lawsuits pending, is, is there any, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. I mean, because we're making this change, which was one of the reasons why they wound up having a lawsuit in the first place, because they, 
they found out about something after the timeline had, had expired in terms of them questioning the permit, there's no issues about us putting something in place at the moment without those two cases having been resolved or decided Just, upon. I, I don't believe any of those cases are direct onto this point onto the degree to which the town provided notification. In fact, you know, I, I believe in all of these suits, it's people suing other people, and we had, we're listed as a party. I don't recall that we're being directly sued. Okay. All right. Just curious. David? Uh, just as a bit of a follow-up to Jamie's last question, I think one of the reasons why we limited the notice to additions or structures within close proximity to the setback or to the ocean was uh, the, the, the feeling among at least the ordinance committee that just because you're building an addition doesn't mean notice goes out to your neighbors if you're not going to be doing something, something that will impact them as directly as a structure with being that close to the setback. So there was a desire to limit the times that notice would go out. I didn't express that very coherently, but that was essentially uh, the intent, at least from the ordinance committee. Here. And, and then going back to Jamie's point, you don't see any issues with that in, you know, going back and rethinking that decision that you made. I mean, it's clear that, you know, the impact is a very clear determiner in whether we give notice or not to the neighbors. But it, it sounds to me like it's pretty solid in terms of it's not impactful, so therefore why? But, you know, it's like everything else, I'm sure. Um, Frank? The only, the only thing I can think of is, is uh, in instances where people are raising the, the roof of their home yeah. and blocking views. Yeah. And how does that get covered? Yeah. And, well, that's a volume issue, right? More, more often than not, that'll be within 125 feet of the ocean is where those issues will arise. So we'll, we, will, we will capture most, most of those with that. Okay. Good. Any other, uh, David and Michael? Just quickly to follow up with Jamie's question. The, the ordinance does not define minimum setback. It defines both setback and front setback, but as Ben mentioned, within all sorts of tables, it then takes this definition and refers to a minimum setback, which is, you know, ties back in with the setback definition. Good. Any further? Okay. Kathy? So uh, with all, maybe most of the questions answered, I'd like to um, move that we approve the building permit issuant notification procedure. Can I, can I ask one more question of Ben? I'll be in here. Okay. Um, can you hold that yep. thought? We're looking for a second, and until we get yep. one, we, <laughs> we could get a second and then have the question, but let's... Doesn't matter, whatever. Uh, do you, uh, yeah. Jamie, go ahead. Uh, ben, so with both the properties are, that are in court in Shore Acres, would this, uh, the 10 foot minimum setback, would that have captured those two properties? Yes, not, not the 10 foot setback, the 125, 125 feet to the water. Because it's second floor. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Is that and, 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 yeah, so I guess that begs the question of are we only concerned with houses that are being built on the water or are we concerned in, in general where, wherever they are in town? Well, I think the primary concern is the, the waterfront. That, I think that's where most of these issues arise, but there there was a, opinions expressed from people that came in that really wanted other triggers in there, such as get people getting close to the setback. So that that was mostly in response to public feedback that we got. Mm -hmm. but doesn't this also apply, Ben, to any expansion of a structure if it's within 10 feet of the, the yeah. setback? So it's really, right. it's if something is real close to a setback line, then it would apply. Right. And that's basically getting at the other issue the council's been getting at sometimes is when, you know, people claim with some of these short things, but remember the survey requirement and yeah. that whole discussion. <coughs> yeah. uh, when and there's no, something no really burst. close by to, to well, wood, wood crest or whatever it, yeah. is, it was a problem. Yeah. And there's been others too, but just to be sure that if folks, you know, have have their own issues and concerns about property lines, uh, not that we take us take a position on it, yeah. but at least w they have a chance to make us aware of those concerns. So did you, uh, you don't need to restate your, uh, your motion. As stated would... a couple minutes ago. Okay. We have a second for Kath, second, David. Second. Thank you. Um, do we have any discussion or further discussion? Yes, Jessica. 
I think this is actually not part of the uh, addition to the ordinance, but I noticed a, um, I think a grammatical issue in D, section D1. It reads, the decision of the code enforcement officer shall be in writing citing the provisions of the ordinance that apply and communicated directly to the applicant. It probably should read either be communicated directly to the applicant or communicate directly to the, uh, to the applicant. Just a little clearer that way. I don't know so I with know. our English teacher's um, direction, would you amend the, uh, would, do you have a point of view about that one, Ben? That's not a new section. That's an exit. I know. That's oh, okay. It's okay. existing. Okay. Yeah, I just I noticed it. I know Somewhere. it's existing. Yeah. So, I, it bothered me. <laughs> so do we need to correct the old section, or are we moving on with the new? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so this is a, there's a conjunctive between writing and communicating, so I think the shall be refers to both writing and communication. No, so it, you don't think it's incorrect? I don't think so. I think okay. either way it's fine, so I'd be inclined <laughs> to leave it as leave it is. Leave it the way it is. As the second, you, you'd have to make modification in your oh, motion okay, anyway. Sorry. So. Oh, there you go. So we're going to leave it to Kathy. Oh, thanks. It's your decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, where's Mary Bruns? <laughs> um, whatever the council prefers, I mean, yeah. Uh, why don't I withdraw my suggestion? Okay, so we're gonna leave, we're gonna vote on this as is. Okay, <laughs> it's the motion stands. It's been seconded. I'm gonna move the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Ben and Kathy and the ordinance committee. Thank you, Thank you for your hard work. Appreciate your uh, your efforts. Okay, uh, item number 118: the Trout Brook grant application. And uh, I guess uh, move this to uh, town planner Maureen has been working on this with some <coughs> representatives of the Soil and Water Conservation Service, the city of South Portland, some property owners and others, and she's here to give an update and to introduce the folks that are with her. And I'm here with um, Patrick Morass and Chris Baldwin from the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District. and. Um, I also have a map here that shows you a section of Trout Brook. Trout Brook Watershed is an urban impaired watershed in, let's see, I was pulling my old notes, I think it was 2007. The town council created a community fee utilization program and the benefit of that program is we had a developer who was going to have to pay a fee um, and either he was going to spend money in another town to do some stormwater improvements or we could keep the money here in Cape Elizabeth and wait for a good project. So the council created the, pro the community fee utilization program, the CFUP, and we've had that money sitting waiting for a good project. Um, Along comes the Trout Brook Watershed, and I'm hoping that most of you remember that the council, I think, recently approved a Trout Brook Watershed Management Plan. The City of South Portland and the Town of Cape Elizabeth have been working jointly on this watershed. We've had a tremendous amount of leadership from South Portland, We've had a lot of interest from the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission, the South Portland Conservation Commission. They met jointly in May. We have had a steering group that got together for a different grant and we decided that there was a bunch of projects that we wanted to apply for right on the Cape South Portland border. Uh, that other grant didn't really match what we were proposing. Uh, we weren't invited to submit a full grant application, but we have prepared a grant application for the 319 grant program, and that's what we're looking for, for authorization from the council tonight to authorize us to submit a grant that would allow us to make some improvements both to uh -oh the equestrian center on Route 77, which the boundary with South Portland is right about here. This is the Church of Latter-day Saints, and the equestrian center uh, Trout Brook runs right through here, and we are basically talking about a whole series of improvements along this section to uh, basically clean the water that's flowing off these properties before it enters the brook. 
So um, if you have any specific questions about the proposal, what I'd like to do is bring up our experts and have them tell you one of the specific things that we're talking about. But what we'd like to do is take $22,000 from the CFUP program and use it as a match for a grant program that requires a 40% 40, 40 match. So this allows us to stretch our dollars a much farther distance. And it really does help us, in particular with this agricultural use, in um, helping them do some work to clean up their stormwater. Um, the town would be putting in some in-kind resources, some financial resources. The equestrian center is also putting in some financial resources and some in-kind resources. The Latter-day Saints has offered some in-kind resources and permission to use their property. So we've really been able to pull together a lot of different groups very quickly. And of course, um, we have two days until the grant is due. So. <laughs> Just threw that in at the end. It's good. Thank you. Any questions so far? Good. Well, do we want our guests to at least uh, come up to the podium and introduce themselves? So uh, we, uh, I mean, it's a. Uh, yes, David. But it might be interesting also to hear about the progress that they've made to date on this sure. overall sure. project. Sure, maybe they can do, yeah. Uh, and I'm Patrick Maris, uh, I'm the Urban Watershed Coordinator from the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. And I'm Christopher Baldwin, District Engineer with the Soil and Water Conservation District. Good. And David's question about progress with the work that you folks have been doing, any update you could give us? I mean, it's uh, pretty exciting in a lot of ways, so anything you could report on progress to date or anything that you want to brag about? <laughs> um, well, so we're, we're currently managing a Phase 1 grant for Trout Brook, um, and actually the City of South Portland is the grantee for that, but we've been partnering with uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth. We've done a lot of outreach to the neighborhoods, kind of the State Avenue neighborhood here. Um, one of the projects we're gonna try to be doing is putting some buffer plantings in along the edge here, because there's some drainage problems, um, as some of you may know, in that neighborhood. So we've made some outreach there. Um, we've also done some outreach to the farms. There's three farms in the watershed, so we've done some outreach to them as well. Um, we're going to be doing some outreach to some uh, neighborhoods in South Portland as well. So we've reached out um, to some neighborhoods there. Um, so we really, the grant started back in May. Um, so we've kind of hit the ground running. And through the outreach that we were able to do to the ag, we found out that this property was interested in doing some more work with us. Um, so that was kind of the initial push of the first phase was to do more, more outreach um, and then get into the neighborhoods and kind of do some education. Um, so that's great. what we've done to date. Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, are any of the activities of any of the abutting landowners negatively affecting the watershed right now? From the, uh, the abutting, so not, not including these two right here? No, including them. Oh, including, yeah, these, uh, both of these properties were identified in the watershed management plan as having, um, you know, having adverse effects on the water quality through the stormwater. Um, so there's some drainage. Um, issues, I guess you could say, with, with the horse farm, with the way the paddocks come down, um, and also with this large amount of impervious surface right along the, uh, the stream right here. Both these properties were identified in the watershed management plan as, you know, we're, we're going to try to address some of those issues as we implement the plan and try to restore Trout Brook. Um, so both of these properties were initially um, identified in the planning process. And that's one of the reasons why we targeted them for, for this next phase. And is part of the plan to address the future behavior of those landowners? Yeah, part of, part of this project, um, we're, we're trying to kind of educate them and change the way that they look at what they, they do on their property. Um, and so we've already made a lot of um, great contact with the equestrian center, um, and, and she had recently um, per purchased the property, or not purchased, but um, started running the property there. And she was well aware of some of the drainage issues that she had and was really interested in doing some work to try and address those, but as you can imagine, a lot of these fixes are, are fairly expensive, so being able to stretch her dollars um, as far as we can is what the purpose of this grant application is. Uh, just to, a horse farm is a very nutrient-rich environment, and particularly as that goes into the brook, if, if you have a very nutri nutrient-rich environment in the brook, that's what causes all sorts of stuff to grow that you don't want growing and, and interrupts with the natural flow of, of yeah, that's correct. So specifically, 
what we're, what we're proposing to do um, includes right now the manure. There's 22 horses on the, in the equestrian center. We're proposing to put a covered manure storage facility here right now. The pile is, ju is just kind of out in the open, so when it rains, it can, it can flow through it. So we're trying to do address that. We're going to be taking, this is a very 1,800 square foot roof right here. We're going to be trying to take that rainwater. Right now, it flows down across the paddocks, and in high rains, or in heavy rains, it'll actually flow across the parking lot here. Um, and so what we're going to try and do is collect that rainwater there, um, build some swales along the edge to try and contain it onto that property, and build what are called uh, gravel wetlands. They're a, you know, a stormwater treatment um, device, so we're going to try and collect that, treat it, um, get as much of the nutrients out as we can before it gets into the brook. So those are the more specifics um, mm -hmm. for the horse farm, trying to address that, that nutrient issue which was identified in the plan as one of the problems on this stretch of the stream was the, the high nutrients, which causes low dissolved oxygen, as Michael mentioned, mm -hmm. some problems in, for the stream. In the Mormon church, it's the parking lot on the roof, I guess. Yep, so we're proposing to collect, this is a large, this is about 1,700 square feet, the roof here. So we're going to be trying to collect, what? 17,000. Oh, 17,000, sorry. Roofs. Yeah, 17,000. Um, so we're trying to collect that as well. Um, and then this corner of the parking lot right here, is right along the stream, so we're going to be, there's some uh, scouring happening along the bank, so we'll try and address that, stabilize that. Um, they have an existing stormwater question. detention pond down here, um, and uh, we're going to be trying to rehab that or, or address it right now. It's not functioning properly, so we're going to try and work with that as well. So it's a, it's a high, you know, as you can see, these land uses are really close to the brook, and that proximity allows for a lot more nutrients and a lot more volume issues. Um, so hopefully with this, Will um, if if the application is approved and um, move forward, it will be be good projects for the brook. Great. Well, thank you. That's yeah. great. Um, any any further questions from anybody, Jamie? Yeah. On, so on the other side of the street, what about any of the the abutting landowners on that side with any applications on their lawns? Um, it, it's applications like, as in like you know sometimes people use. Uh, some types of pesticides, pesticides and fertilizers. You're talking, yep. you talking State yep. Street? Yeah, yep. State Street. Okay. Back, back. Yep. And that's what we're. That's you're going this to do for phase. plantings, right? Is yep. that what you're planning? Yep. Yep. So this through this current phase in October, the State Avenue neighborhood is going to have a uh, a neighborhood block party, and we'll be we've been invited to attend that and to talk to residents about kind of lawn or uh, water friendly land use practices. Um, and we're trying. You know, there are some areas that. You know, the lawn comes right up to the stream, so we're going to be trying to put in buffer plantings, like I mentioned, and, and rain gardens, which is another way to collect and infiltrate stormwater runoff. So we're going to try and really hit as many of the uh, landowners directly adjacent to the stream here um, with at that meeting, and then kind of do do some more education and outreach with them. Right there. Is all right. State Street State Street in Cape Elizabeth? Yeah, it is. Park? Yeah, it is. Yeah, the front right on line, the town line kind of zigzags here. And it comes, like Marina mentioned, the South Portland's here, but it um, most, yeah, I think all of this is in, is in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Good. Great. Okay, the chair um, will attend, you know, entertain a motion on uh, authorizing the town manager to uh, make application. So, do we have anybody who wishes to make that? David? I move that we authorize the town manager to apply for a Section 319 grant for the Trout Brook area. I have a second. Jamie, seconded. Any further discussion about this? Did you want to say something? No, I was just being noisy with my <laughs> iPad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeez. I was going to say, whoa, he's got the application all done. That's what he's doing there. So, um, Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank, thank you. you, Maureen, for your time, and best of luck with this. Looks pretty exciting. Big development for us. Okay, item number 119, we're a minor modification to the sore easement behind Rudy's. Yes. Mr. McGovern will give us a Yes, thank, right? thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, I think everyone is aware that Rudy's has been, is, is about to be redeveloped. In fact, the building permit was just recently issued. <coughs> it, uh, there could be some activity there very, very shortly. One of the things <coughs> is looking at the building permit application is they're putting in a, a, a wood, one of these wood, burning pizza oven types things you know with the and it, it when we reviewed the plans it infringed ever so slightly onto the easement and they wanted us to reduce the easement we said no we're not going to do that it's only 20 feet 
find another way to do it, suggested they contact the property owner and back. The good news is the property owner was more than happy to work with them. They were able to, to work it out so that uh, they purchased an easement from the, the one and back of like five feet. And as a result, it's a much better easement for further equidistant away from the, the property. So if there ever is a need, it'll be much easier to do. So since the council had approved the original easement, we felt it was appropriate to come back to you and for you to agree to the, the modification with the easement as shown and described in the materials. Do I have a motion? Yes, Frank. I move that we authorize a minor modification to the easement behind Rudy's. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by David. Any discussion? Yes, Jamie. I didn't know whether or not any of this would require further site plan review. Yeah, if you look at the, the, the agenda, it indicates that this is also subject to approval by the planning board. You know, we, we won't file this amendment until they also approve of it. It was, it was one of these chicken and egg ones, you know, which goes first. And right. our, you know, our, our hope, the planning board meets the next couple of days, and our hope was to, to get it resolved so that, you know, I think everyone, we, we, you know, particularly, you know, you hear about a bank closing in town, and you know, we, need, we need to help out the local businesses to uh, uh, mm -hmm. be successful. Any other questions? Um, Caitlin, did um, we, we're I just to bring up to speed. We're we're working on this minor modification to a sewer easement behind Rudy's. Mm -hmm. it relates to a wood burning uh, stove that needs a small modification to what we've already given them. So just to bring you in the, into the loop. Um, it, no other no other discussion. Okay. All those in favor of the motion. All those opposed. It's unanimous. Moving on to one, uh, item 120, a request for an amendment extending the use of sandwich board signs. Do you wish to bring that up? or uh... I'd be happy to if you'd like me to. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, under the current ordinance, the sign ordinance is, I believe, a 90-day limitation on sandwich board signs. Uh, we heard from a member of the Cape Business Alliance, Janice Stock Stockson, who owns the Shore and Things consignment shop over in back of us here. Uh, that should like the, the town to consider some different policies involving those sandwich board signs. Uh, I was a little bit unsure from her letter if she was representing the, the business alliance, or she said she was a member of the business alliance, but regardless, you know, some of the other members of the business alliance have also expressed concerns about sandwich board signs, and, you know, it, it seems as though a review uh, might be appropriate since uh, there is quite a bit of interest. And I will detain a motion. Anyone wish to make a motion on this? Frank. Um, I move that we refer this request for the uh, amendment extending the use of sandwich board signs to the ordinance uh, committee. And second. we have a second. Second, Caitlin. Thank you. Any further discussion? Well, I, I note that the moving council member and the seconder are both not on the ordinance committee, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. I will notes note, reflect uh, that. But it, the issue has come up, so I, I think it makes sense to send it along to us for review. Good. Any uh, conversation? No. I'll move. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous, 7 zip. Item 121 the outdoor shooting range um, questions that relates to hiring Ken Cole. Um, before we move on this, we need to ask Jamie to... Do I literally have to step down? You have to... Yeah. Step, yeah. Not, there's no have stepping wave. down step, now because we're, we're on the same level, so we have to ask you to sit in the first row or front row or whatever, if you would be so kind. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion? David. Uh, I move that the town retain attorney Kenneth Cole of the Jensen Baird Law Firm to assist in the development of a potential ordinance ordinance amendments relating to outdoor shooting ranges and to report back to the council by December 2nd, 2013. Do I have a second? Second, Caitlin, thank you. Any discussion? 
The only question is the, the date that we decided on, December 2nd, is that considered like the first time to really realistically get something back? Yeah, you know, it, it, that's true. At the, the meeting the other day, we discussed the end of November, and then I actually looked at the calendar and just the way the Thanksgiving and whatever, it, it, it just seemed to make sense at the beginning of next week. But it, you know, it seems like a reasonable amount of time for him to meet with the various parties to see if there's, if, if there's any, you know, can, any coming together of the minds. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, to the degree that there is and the degree that there isn't, for them to him to then put together a proposal for, for uh, the council to consider. It'll be something good for the new council to handle. I was just thinking that. exactly that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm council. more than happy to have whoever made this motion modify it so it fits into your very last meeting. No, it's okay. Are you sure? No, we can do take up the rooster issue at the same time if you want. <laughs> oh, you want us to cover all of the unfinished business for your four years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think this is a real opportunity uh, to to work on this issue and to and to have the parties coming together to talk about the various issues and uh, hopefully uh, bringing something forward that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other conversation? No. All those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie, for coming back up to the table. It's, it's no longer a stepping down, if you notice. It's kind of it's moved to the side, <laughs> whatever. Okay, number 122, library space planning. We have a recommendation here. Uh, anybody want to give any background to this? Uh, we have a couple of people on the, on the library. The committee chair. And we also have the committee chair. Would you like, Jessica? Well, um, <clears throat> the committee chairman is in the audience. So if it uh, so, pleases the council, perhaps she would like to speak to us. So Molly, would you like to come up and join us? Thank you. I need to introduce myself. Yes. Well, no? she, for the folks at home. Yeah, thank you. Molly McCausland, I'm the chair of the Library Planning Committee. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we have been a very busy committee for the last, I don't know what it's been, <clears throat> five months, four months? It seems like we meet at least every 10 days or so. Um, as you may know, we had our um, public input meeting on August 29th. I thought we had pretty good turnout. We had close to 70 people come to that meeting. And we've reached a point in our process now where we're ready to hire an architectural firm to come and help us do some work on programming. And as a committee, we interviewed, or a subcommittee of the larger committee, we interviewed four firms, all highly qualified, all very enthusiastic. Um, it was a hard choice to make, but I think the final decision was um, the right one. And we selected, am I allowed to say that, Mike, or is it public now? Yes. We selected Reed & Company. They're a Portland-based architectural firm, small firm. They have worked on, um, I think it's 20 public library projects in the last 30 years. They're very experienced and very knowledgeable about the process in general and about our process specifically. So I think tonight what is on your agenda is a request to fund that programming work for us. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody else might have, but that's pretty much where we're at in the process. Well, let us get a, let, let's get a motion in a second. Okay. Stay right there. Don't I will. Us. Can I have a motion? Uh, yes. Um, I move that we approve. Uh, item uh, 122, a library space planning and authorize the town manager to spend an amount not to exceed $20,000 to continue development of plans for space for library services. Do I have a second? second? Yes, Kathy, seconded. We have discussion. Any questions for Molly or for any member of the planning? Caitlin? Just the amount, $20,000. Um, where did that figure come from? What's the reality of reaching it I, uh, looking at molly i think yes. I'll do that. The, the particular contract with reading company will be for fifteen thousand dollars there's also an alternate there uh for for five thousand dollars to come up with a rendering of what the exterior might look like at this point you know and, and I, I wrote an email to to mr reed today 
indicating that I was, you know, pending tonight's action, I was inclined to agree to sign the agreement for the, the 15000 <coughs> but as far as the rendering, that would be something we would consider later on at some point to authorize that. But it, uh, so it's 15000 for the direct, and then, you know, some, you get other incidental expenses as well. So uh, that's the, the gist of uh, where the money comes the, the proposal. And their proposals, I think, am I, sorry, am I still allowed to no, speak? Go right yes. ahead. Okay. Speak. They're, all the proposals from the four firms that we talked to were pretty much all in the same range, pretty much around $15,000. Yeah. Caitlin, any further? Just going to ask, it was, I read the RPF or whatever the letters are there for the bid to go out, um, and it says it's based on an hourly rate, so they truly believe it's going to take 15000 dollars worth of hourly work to complete? I, I think typically on the projects I've worked on in the past, most architects will provide you with an hourly rate, but um, you have a little bit of negotiating room. And in this particular situation, we asked based on the proposals that we received what people were anticipating the overall project cost would be. And what we heard really across the board was you're looking at fifteen thousand dollars. I think, just if I might, I think the other thing to note is that in the interview and in discussion, it was indicated that this would be a credit uh, toward the overall architectural fees if the project should continue, with the architectural fees being primarily based on this, the rates that are established by the state of Maine through the Bureau of General Services. So it would it would be a credit as well to the overall architectural fees for the project. You're all set, Caleb, on that? Okay, Frank. Maybe Molly can just describe what we're going to get for that money to say. Sure. Mike, do you have a copy of that scope of work that you sent along today? Because it might be good to give people an idea based on that document what all is included. It was a one-page document, and I think they were pretty specific in terms of what it was they were going to do for us. I, in a nutshell, I can give you a real quick overview, but I, I, in terms of being accurate, it might be better to be looking at that document. I think what they'll um, be looking at is all the work that has been done in the past. They'll review the programming work that was done. They'll take a look at the um, documentation that has identified the outstanding deficiencies in the building. Um, they'll work with um, what I'll call some focus groups or some smaller groups of people from the greater community, get a sense of what's, what, um, I'll give you an example, what um, the parents of school-aged children might be interested in seeing specifically in a library program. Thank you. Oh, that's great. So, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to read from this. So in their first um, service item, they'll be reviewing all of the existing information, as I just mentioned. They'll look at the previous studies that have been done, the property survey work, uh, the existing building conditions and deficiencies. They'll take a look at the um, input that we heard at the roundtable discussion on August 29th. Um, step two, they'll be looking for input about the needs and goals for the library. They'll be looking at the um, input from our library planning committee, and they'll also be looking at input, certainly, from the library director and his staff. And then they'll finally be looking for some input from the school folks. Uh, third, they'll work at developing a preliminary building program using the available models of library space allocations. And I think what they're referring to specifically there is the, the um, standards by either the American Library Association or the Maine Library Association. They'll be looking at um, comparing existing Thomas Memorial Library space allocations to what they are proposing in a new document that would extend that. Am I? Okay. Yes, I could hear the echoing back there. Thank you. Um, uh, fourth, they'll be using the proposed new space allocations to develop what they're calling a concept plan. And that would include a site plan and then, um, and this is extremely preliminary because one of the things that they talked to us about, can you still hear me? I feel like I'm getting softer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that they had talked to us about was the difference between 
the possibility of doing a building that's all on one floor versus a two-story building and what some of the implications of that might be in terms of both um, operating efficiencies for the library staff but also for the operating efficiencies of the building itself. Better? Is that okay? This, I'm sorry. All of us okay. getting like the echo effect that we had earlier. Yeah, it's not a bad idea, but it's, it's, yeah. Okay, okay. sorry. Better, I'm sorry. Better when that door is closed. Okay. Um, so on their um, item number four, they're saying they're going to look at the site plan and also a lower level plan and an upper level plan. As I said, this is very preliminary because I don't think we're that far along in the planning process to know whether we're talking about a single story building or a two story building. Or, or a renovation versus a uh, Absolutely. Uh, number five, prepare a project budget based on the proposed building program. And number six, assess the, they call it the TML Advisory Committee, we've called it the Library Planning Committee, um, in presentations to the community. So again, we'll be looking for more input from the public. Um, might be in a, a smaller focus group kinds of sessions rather than the kind of community input meeting that we had in August that was um, as I said, I, I think well attended with close to 70 people coming to that. Yes, Great. Caitlin. Thank you. Yes, Caitlin. I just, just to clarify, make sure I heard you correctly. So they're going to look at, you know, an option, one story, two story, renovations versus rebuild, and give all that information for those basically four different options, the budgets, the, like step four, you kind of said they would do the one story, the two story, and Frank said the renovations versus rebuild and then step five was budgets and all that Does yes I, I think our expectation that is is that at the end of this process we will have a recommendation to bring to the council and it will have been based on looking at those various scenarios including the budget implications for each one of those we haven't identified four specific options that we haven't no no just I was just saying all of those Basically, options my question are out was: there. They're going to look at several different options, right. give the right. budget for several different options, give all the information for several different options. This was, you know, not that they would give options and then you would pick which option to get all of the rest of the information for. Does that make sense? No. Okay. So, as Kathy shaking her head. So, if they were to give you four options, give you four options, the committee, and then they only take that one option that you select to give out the rest of their information. I don't think they'll give us four options. I think it will be a give and take process for us to get input from them, for us to give input back to them, for us to get further input from the community, and get a sense of the overall needs for the project. And once we have more clearly defined what those needs are and how they can best be um, addressed, we'll ask them to do a little bit more work on that and then on budgeting for that. And then that will be our recommendation to the council after we've been through kind of massaging each mm -hmm. one of those possible options or any and all of those scenarios. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say it's, it's going to be a very iterative an interactive mm. process so and they've got the, I mean, as Molly said they've done over 20 libraries very similar to ours in terms of the sort of the uh, demographics of the towns and one of the things that was extremely appealing about them was that they really understood what we we're going through many of their projects have been going on for five to ten years before the towns could really come to grips yeah. with what they were going to do and they had this intuitive sense of what we needed which made that it's very appealing as a uh, mm -hmm. uh, firm to work with, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. Any further questions from Molly? Yes, Jamie. I take it the, um, the building deficiencies will just be a review of the existing uh, report, not a new analysis. I think that's correct. I think they will start with the existing report, but I, I, I know architects, and I know most architects really love buildings for one reason or another, and I think because they are architects, they will spend time walking through that building and looking pretty carefully at what's there, how it exists right now. Um, I think that's kind of the mindset, and I think doing that kind of a walkthrough gets architects more excited and gets their creative juices flowing and makes them probably more productive and certainly more creative in coming up with their solutions. So while 
with my particular background, I'm more likely to look at the list of 102 deficiencies and want to check them off one by one and say, we need to deal with this, we need to deal with that. I suspect that they'll be more likely to look at that list and walk through the space and envision the possibilities rather than look to fix a particular problem. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Good. Any, Thank you. any other questions? There's a yeah. question for maybe Mike. I came onto the council as this was just starting, so just if we could, a quick refresh for me as to what we did that led to the first proposal. Did we do this process or did we do a different process? How did we get to the, the first drawing? Yeah, through the chair. Uh, yeah, the, the first, the earlier process started maybe about seven years ago. The library, it started with the library trustees. They were very interested in looking at future library space issues, space needs, addressing a whole host of issues with the library. Uh, they came to the council. They got permission to hire a couple of firms. Uh, they did some interviewing. They ended up hiring uh, a library consulting firm as well as an architectural firm. Uh, they then went and uh, had all sorts of focus group meetings, all sorts of different meetings. They, they sort of involved the council a little bit late in the process. The council had a meeting uh, that, quite frankly, didn't go very well uh, back about four years ago because they, they presented for about three hours. That's a slight exaggeration. The council really didn't have much of a chance to ask questions, and it was, it was a bad start. Uh, the then process uh, continued. Uh, they looked at uh, working with the architect different design iterations. They looked at the potential of fundraising. The council authorized the hiring of a fundraising consultant. Uh, there was uh, another focus group, study group, that looked at the different plan and suggested you, you ought to refer to it as a cultural center. Uh, that then got a backlash uh, as, as that went on, and it, it just, you know, kept going on. The, the, the good thing about, I think, this process uh, is that, you know, I, th I think we, we've, we've learned from the mistakes of the past. Uh, we, we know that there was concern in the past about affordability. We know there was concern about process. We know there was concern about fixing different issues. Uh, we know that there were real integrations, real issues of the integration with the school community and how we might cooperate with them. And there were also issues with uh, just the whole cost structure of the whole thing. Uh, which goes back to the affordability issue. And, you know, as, as Frank said, and Molly has also alluded to, th this particular firm with their broad main experience working with libraries and having read the different materials and knowing the process that we already went through, believe that they can learn from that process, uh, both with, with some of the facts and data that's there, but, but also need, also understand that we need new solutions. Uh, because the previous solution was, was clearly uh, not approved at the polls. And it is a very different process this time. We do have three town councillors on the committee, <clears throat> excuse me, a school board member, and I'm a trustee at the Thomas Memorial Library. So we, we have, we're starting from a different point, and I think our expectation is we will have a, a, certainly a better process that I hope will be very inclusive of various points of view within the community, but I think we also are very aware of what went to the voters last time, and um, I think we're being, I think, somewhat more cautious and more conservative about how we approach the project. Um, I'll, I'll just give you my own two cents. I want the right solution. I don't want an overpriced and oversized solution, nor do I want a short-sighted solution that leaves us with a renovated building or a new building that is either cheaply built or undersized and puts us back in the same spot 10 years or 20 years from now when we all know that libraries are changing. Technology changes every single day. So whatever we plan for, it needs to be the right solution, and it needs to be the right solution for the long term, not the right solution for next week or next year or even the next two to five years. So I, I think we have a very different process and a very different approach this time. And I'm, I'm very optimistic about the work that our committee has done, but also about where we'll end up. And 
we'll be back, I suspect, in early November. That's my, my target. Our Are committee has worked very to, hard. Good, thank you, Molly. Yes, ready you're to take a vote here? Mm -hmm. Jessica? I just wanted to add that I believe that, um, and Mike can correct me, um, that the, also the 2007 to 2009 library study that was done was also um, a, essentially done as another recommendation of the comprehensive plan because the library was viewed then as a facility that needed review. And so I believe that was also part of that, uh, the beginnings of that. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Looks that way. I just want to say yes. one quick thing. You know, I think another difficulty was in the beginning is that I never sensed the council, never sensed the council felt as though they owned the process. And, you know, I think one good thing about keeping coming back to the council on these different issues is the council is being updated regularly and the, at the same time the public isn't. I think, you know, if, if you really, a lot's going to happen in the next couple months. And, you know, all of these meetings, although there's councilors who serve on them, are open to all council members. And, you know, just because you're not on the committee, you, you, and I know you have busy schedules, but, you know, don't feel as though that you're not welcome to, to fully participate and, and sit in because it, it, this is, you know, a big decision coming up. And uh, I think it, it's really important that, that it, you know, everyone in the community, but particularly the leaders of the community who are elected, uh, really understand uh, the different thought processes that are going into this decision. Thank you. I, I agree. I think that would be very helpful to have more participation anytime it's available. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the library space planning recommendation? We have and all those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Molly, for your thank you. time and talent. And, and thank you for getting me out of here to pick my daughter up at Driver Ed at 825. So that was very good yeah. timing. Thank you. Great. <laughs> good. Okay. Um, item 123, the solar street lighting update. When one of our council goals um, is it's really from uh, Neil Williams. I don't know that you want to update. It just seems to be an update on the status. He admits very very, very quickly in his memo that he's not a specialist when it comes to solar lighting. However, he does give us an update and some of what may have potential down the road, but that's pretty much it. I don't know, Michael, did you want to? Yeah, just, you know, I think he, he gave a report, and I think the, the real key is, I think there's two major points in it, is solar lighting is expensive, and two, part, is in large part a result of work done by South Portland and Falmouth, the legislature, passed a bill allowing municipalities to have more flexibility with their street lighting programs and not be forced into a, the, the cookie cutter approach that, that the utility companies have provided us and uh, the Maine Public Utilities Commission is going to be looking at taking that legislation and giving some meat to it and really seeing you know, what communities can do with, for example, LED alternatives and, and uh, other possibilities. And, so a lot of this is really dependent upon uh, what, what the PUC really comes up with uh, in terms of uh, its interpretation of the, the new legislation that was this past uh, this last session. The update from, in terms of what Greg has done on all of the different buildings in town was also equally interesting yeah. to see how far along that has gone. So is this a, a we just need to accept the report? Acknowledge receipt. Acknowledge receipt. Yeah. Uh, Frank, you have a question? Yeah, why is it coming? Why did Neil do this work as opposed to Greg? Neil oversees the street lighting program for the town. <laughs> public safety. It's a public safety issue. And yeah. He, he, he has to, if someone wants a street light, he's the one that is delegated with making those decisions. So you, you as a council don't need to deal with them at every meeting. Good. <laughs> Can I have a motion to accept Jessica? I move that we accept item num number 123, uh, the uh, solar street lighting update from Chief of Police Neil Williams. I have a second. Yes, Jamie. Thank you. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? All those opposed, it's unanimous. Number item 124, the combined sewer overflow public permit hearing. 
So I need a motion on this item, or do you want to give some background on this uh, first, Michael? Yeah, th this is a mandated public hearing under our combined sewer overflow permit. Uh, we we, we uh, submitted to the DEP about a year and a half ago a, an app, a, a permit <coughs> response application, and they finally acted upon it uh, about 15 months later. And uh, they indicated when they did that, and oh, by the way, now before you do anything, you, now is the time when you, you need to have a public hearing and, and welcome public comment. So uh, it's proposed to be uh, at your meeting on October 7th. There'll be a representative here from Wright Pierce, the engineering firm we're working with, as well as a representative from the Water District uh, on this combined sewer overflow, uh, which is right at the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line again, although this time over by the ocean uh, and not not over by the Trout Brook. But it's, I know you, we did have a workshop. Yeah, uh, we did. Chris Dwinell came right. uh, a while ago, but uh, we now do have this uh, uh, opportunity to have a public hearing and uh, to welcome public comments. Okay. And a copy of the plan is available for public inspection at the Department of Public Works. And I, we were trying to get it online. I'm not sure if it's quite there yet, but if it's, it will be in the next couple of days. Uh, entertain a motion. We should <laughs> make okay. Frank, Frank do the heavy lift. I did two already tonight. That's, oh, yeah. that's two. That's your max? Okay, David. I move that we schedule a public hearing for Monday, October 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, for the combined sewer overflow permit. A second. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped right on that one, Frank, didn't you? That was good. Any uh, discussion about this? No. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? And it, all those opposed, it's unanimous. And the last item on this agenda before we move to the 125 is a second opportunity for our citizens to talk with us on items that are not on the agenda. Seeing no one in the audience, are we getting a phone call from a citizen? Apparently I didn't turn my phone off. Call in. Call in. That would be something. Yeah, it's being perfect. Sorry about that. Let's call them into another game. Okay. Seeing no uh, citizens, we'll move on to item 125, and the chair will uh, entertain a motion. Jessica. Uh, I move that we uh, approve item number one, uh, 125 and enter into executive session to discuss a personnel matter in conformance with MRSA state, uh, section. what is that? S -S section. Section 405-6A. I have a second. Second. Kathy seconded. Uh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Do we? No action pump. Yeah. Cameras will go off. And then we, okay. Good. All right. Just thank you very much. 